Welcome back, geology fans. Through the past three field trips, on campus, Red Rocks, and now North Table Mountain, we have seen our area go back and forth from E-World to D-World and back again. But now as we come to the top of this mesa, we leave D-World for the last time. A few million years before this last lava flow covered the area, the Rocky Mountains uplifted, the pigs stood up, and the eroded pieces of Paleozoic and Mesozoic sediments and Precambrian basement rock deposited onto the flanks until around 62 million years ago, the youngest age of this top lava flow. The edges of these mountains are erosional surfaces, and the colluvium we've seen blanketing the flanks of the mesa on the way up are made from this erosional process. By now, you may be wondering what kind of E-World process made the pit at the top of the mountain, and on our map we see this location marked as a mine, or quarry. Throughout the last century, the town of Golden has mined basalt from this location, putting the broken rock through a hole at the base of this pit now covered over. The rock was placed in rail cars, which ran down the mountain to that knob we saw when we started this hike. The rock is used for construction, mainly as building foundation material, riprap for barriers or erosion control. Less obvious are semicircular excavations at the top that were probably quarries from early European settlers during the gold rush days. Even less obvious and certain are signs of fire pits from Native American mining operations earlier in this mountain's history. But now we jump so much further back in time to finish the geologic story here. The third lava flow turns out to be the largest of all four known flows, and even had a small exposure on the north flank of Green Mountain to the south of South Table Mountain. This statement implies that we know that the basalt capping South Table Mountain is from the same lava flows that cap North Table Mountain. Well, how do we know? Well, lateral continuity says these two top lava flows didn't just stop at their edges, but continued, and they would join the two mesas together at their elevations. The two mesa tops have the same consistent elevation and slope, number of flows, ages, chemistry, which should be enough to convince anyone that these two mountains once made a continuous surface connecting their tops until Clear Creek bisected them. The western edges continued across the Golden Valley as well to the edges of the Front Range Mountains. What happened to all this material that once filled our valley? Clear Creek has eroded this material down the South Platte River to the Platte, to the Missouri, to the Mississippi, and down to the Gulf of Mexico or in storage along the way. Speaking of streams, I mentioned Dr. Drews thinks the second single channel lava flow only made it part way across North Table Mountain. What evidence does he use to support this? This aerial shot of the top surface of North Table Mountain reveals a pronounced linear ridge in the basalt. From ground-level investigations, it appears this feature is what is known as a tumulus, or a ruptured surface of a lava flow caused when fluid pressure below a frozen crust causes this crust to bulge and break. The curvilinear shape of this tumulus suggests that the fluid pressure in this case may have been caused by lava running over a stream and turning its water to steam. Why doesn't the tumulus start at the north end of the mountain? Recall we think that lava flow number two that we had to jump off our trail to see took a single stream channel across this mountain but didn't make it all the way across. Where that lava did flow, it filled up the stream valley and reduced this vapor pressure effect, but where that second flow did not reach, the water in the stream was sufficient to burst the rock crust of the subsequent lava flows. Besides lateral continuity keeping level across Clear Creek Valley, we also see this top flow as a single flow across both mesas because of the same age, chemistry, texture, and stretch bubbles showing similar flow directions. These bubbles and the general slope of the tabletops indicate this flow originated to the north, and a quick journey a couple of kilometers up Highway 93 takes us to the same age, same chemistry, Ralston Dyke Complex, which reveals to us this was a combination of fissure and for these bigger final eruptions, vent eruptions, that ran down across the present-day location of Golden and south to Lakewood. To better visualize the surface in this area 62 million years ago, think about the concept of a stream's longitudinal profile. 
Streams strive to reach an equilibrium between erosion and deposition. As long as the two are different, the stream will cause the surface of the earth to change elevation, but allowed to carve their channels to equilibrium, streams take on this shape. From where they start in the headwaters to the mouth where the stream discharges into a larger body of water or hits its ultimate base level. Looking at Mount Zion, the mountain west of us with the M on it, we see that it has a shoulder on its north flank approaching the canyon that levels out before dropping off. Going up canyon to the next ridge, we see that it too has a shoulder leveling out towards the canyon, but at a slightly higher elevation. And then there are shoulders behind that, rising higher and higher. If we trace these shoulder levels downstream and allow them to level out across the top elevation of the Table Mountains, we see what looks like a stream's longitudinal profile. By tracing erosional terraces in the uplifted front range block, we can infer that the Golden Valley was buried all the way across the valley, at and above the level we are now standing. We have hiked up 400 feet, or about 120 meters, from an already elevated point. The best I can estimate, the buildings at the center of our campus would have had about 500 feet, or 150 meters, of deposited sediment above them, but also have around 2 miles of sediment below them. The basement rock is the Idaho Springs Nice exposed in the mountains directly to our west, and from this vantage point we can trace out the golden fault which uplifted the front range block to our west and drop the basin block we are on around two miles to accommodate all this eroded sediment. Now we see just what an immense volume of rock was removed from this valley and transported downstream, and the effect this has had on our surroundings. The landscape we see around us is a function of differential erosion, as some rocks erode more quickly than others. On the Table Mountains, we get bench and cliff topography, where less resistant rocks make benches of lower slope, and the more resistant layers make cliffs, just as you might see in the erosional Grand Canyon. Here, less resistant Denver formation undercuts the basalt layers until the columns give way and tumble down the face of the mountain, some coming to rest as colluvium on the slopes and others making it all the way down into where developers decided to make some money. The houses flanking the Table Mountains are not only at risk from landslides in the Denver formation, but also rockfall from the Table Mountain basalt. As we approach the edge of the cliff, we get a sense of the size of the boulders these columns break into. Most are a couple of meters in diameter, and they fall at 9.81 meters per second squared until they hit the ground. If the boulder bounces, it will continue its motion with minimum friction to slow it. A bouncing boulder can make it clear into the second row of houses we see at the base of this mountain, as testified by these homeowners proudly displaying the evidence of risk in their yards. So far, only one house on the side of South Table Mountain has been hit back in the 1970s, and fortunately no one has been injured yet. To mitigate this problem, we could zone the areas around the base of the... Uh, yeah, never mind, too late. Guess it's up to you guys to educate yourselves and consider any risks before buying a property. The developers clearly don't recognize nor respect the risk. So, what else can we do to lower risk? We could use shotcrete, which is used extensively in our area to stabilize rock faces. But the Table Mountains are iconic to the city of Golden, and people would throw a fit about shotcreting the surfaces. Similarly, chain fences that we see on unstable rock faces could be too obtrusive, though there are some fences on the south slope of this mountain upslope from some risky houses. I had one student suggest digging a giant ditch or moat around the mountains. Yeah. No. Prohibitively expensive and ecologically damaging. Uh, perhaps the citizens would go for bolting, in which unstable rocks are drilled through and bolted to the stable rock behind them. Such features are less obvious. Or we could just remove boulders at high risk of fall with heavy machinery, which is frequently done in the mountain canyons to our west. Or you just wait for it to happen, clean up after the fact, and hope no one gets hurt or killed. From this lofty perch, we will summarize what we have gleaned from our field trip today. 
we saw a horizontal Denver formation whose flat-lying position tells us it was deposited after and from the uplift of the nearby Rocky Mountains, known as the Laramide Orogeny, after the Laramie Formation we saw on our campus. The depositional environment of our basin allowed accumulation of alluvial sediments and a recording of geologic history. With the KT, or KPG, boundary located below the first lava flow on South Table Mountain, we know this uplift was done by 65.5 million years ago, at which time an asteroid impact dealt a deadly blow to the non-avian dinosaurs, taking us from the age of reptiles to the age of mammals. Though the Rocky Mountains were done with the main part of their uplift in this area, they had not completely quieted, and a mafic magma came up to the surface in fissures and vent eruptions to give fingers of lava following stream channels in our area around 64 million years ago. The alluvial depositional record continues in the Denver Formation right up to the second lava flow, entering in a single stream channel from the north and the two larger flows 62 million years ago. The second flow probably didn't make it across the mountain and was followed by a third and largest flood basalt covering the area and flowing to the south, which in turn, after a time long enough to make stream channels, was covered by a fourth and final flow which also made a flood basalt but not as extensive. In fact, on South Table Mountain, the third flow seems to have formed a dome from liquid pressure below, and the fourth lava flow only wraps around the edges of this dome. We only see moderate deposition after this, and note stream profile evidence for a paleo surface, which the Colorado School of Mines campus is far below. From the top of this mountain to the low points at the creek, it appears serious erosion from Clear Creek took place at a rate of at least 500 feet per 62 million years, or about one ten thousandth of an inch per year, about .002 millimeters per year. Clear Creek and its tributaries carved this valley out to its present depth, and differential erosion has produced its landscape a landscape where humans have extracted a variety of resources, found beauty and awe, and contemplated the scope of their existence. I hope some of that has rubbed off on you. Thanks for joining me.